So the atomists can be characterized in our standard way uh, by saying that everything is atoms and the void, right? Um, the main atomists among the ancient Greeks, is, it says here, were Leucippus and his student Democritus, from the fifth to, who lived from the 5th to the 4th century BC, and another uh, famous uh, ancient Greek philosopher named Epicurus came uh, quite a bit later. They're all atomists. And what we know about the ideas of these figures come mostly from a figure named Lucretius, who lived in the 1st century BC, and who wrote a book called On the Nature of Things. I think you might be familiar with Epicurus, the name Epicurus, uh, who's associated with Epicureanism and sometimes, a, you know, uh, a gourmet shop or something might be called the Epicurean, right? Which is meaning a person who sort of enjoys sort of simple pleasures in life, right? Because Epicuria, Epicurus, aside from being an atomist, had a sort of ethic which was basically based around kind of a moderate hedonism, right? The idea that you should in, you know, basically do what you can to enjoy pleasures in life and avoid pains and in, enjoy pleasures in a moderate way so that you avoid, um, you know, uh, unnecessary suffering. That's sort of a simple, over, you know, simplistic summary of it. In any case, though, we're concerned with the metaphysics and, and the atomism. Okay. So... We're going to, like we said, most of what we know about uh, this comes from Lucretius or reports from Lucretius. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to go through some premises of atomism and we'll show the arguments that were given for these. And then we'll put them together and see the whole picture afterwards. One of the things that they say is that nothing is created, right? And this is... Um, could be something which is a Parmenidean uh, uh, premise, something that they might have been influenced by Parmenides. Um, it might be just an intuitive idea. Parmenides thought, remember, that nothing really comes into being from nothing because that would mean that what is not would be what is, and that's a contradiction, which is kind of what we call now an a priori argument against the proposition that anything could come to be, right, or pass away from existence. Um, a priori meaning that you, are, you come to the conclusion on the basis purely from, you know, what it means to come to be, just the, the basis of the, the very idea or concept itself, right? So in that case, the idea is the very concept of coming to be is absurd and contradictory, therefore it's impossible. Remember when we spoke about the ontological argument for the existence of God and we distinguished between the a priori type of argument and the a posteriori argument. So the argument that Lucretius gives here is more of an empirical argument, meaning it's uh, an a, a posteriori argument or based on observation. And that is that if things can come to be from nothing, then the universe would be in complete chaos. Right, um, But the observation on which it's based is that the universe is not in total chaos and therefore things cannot come to be from nothing. Right, So we could say, for example, where do apple trees come from? They just pop into existence? Well, no, they come from apple seeds, which if planted in the ground will grow into apple trees and those apple seeds come from previous apple trees, right? So uh, things just don't come into beef out of nothing. They, they are other things that change into those things, right? They come to be from previously existing forms, yeah? Um, and if it were the case that apple trees could come from, you know, didn't have to come from apple seeds, but just could come to be anywhere, then, you know, one could pop in, one might be popping up in my room right behind me, or, you know, anything, and it would be just total random chaos. But it's not. That's sort of a more empirical argument against the idea that things are created, right, in the sense that they come to be from nothing. Okay. Secondly, 
they say nothing is destroyed, right? Nothing comes into existence and then also nothing ceases to exist or just disappears from existence. Uh, and they have a little bit of a longer argument here, so you see what we have. The first premise says that since nothing comes to be from nothing, then the world has existed for eternity, right? So that's assuming that they've proved nothing comes to be from nothing. That means the world has been, has always existed from eternity, right? Did not have a beginning. And the second premise is that if matter could become non-existent, right? If matter could disappear and become non-existent, then after some finite period of time, all matter would be gone, right? Right? If matter could cease to exist, then it would cease to exist at some point in time if you wait long enough, right? Because it makes sense, right? If someone says, no, no matter how long you wait, matter won't cease to exist, well, that just means that it cannot cease to exist, which is what the, democ what the atomists uh, are arguing, right? But then, you know, the fact is that if the universe has existed from eternity, then an infinite period of time has already passed at this point in time, and matter has not ceased to exist yet. So, if matter could become non-existent, then it would already be non-existent. That comes from the previous premises, two and three, right? If it's the case that matter would become existent after some finite period of time, then the fact that an infinite period of time has already passed it follows from that that matter should not exist now, right? But matter does exist now, it's around us. So that means it cannot become non-existent. It's like permanent, eternal, okay? So nothing can be created and nothing can be destroyed. Yeah. All right. Third premise of atomists. Now here's where they definitely differ with Empedocles. So remember when Empedocles, he had the idea of the plenum he, uh, based on uh, the sort of Parmenidean, Parmenidean again, uh, uh, premise that you know, uh, nothing is not a thing. Empedocles uh, said there's no empty space, there's no void, right? There's no place where nothing exists. We, the, the universe is full of being. That's what we call the plenum. The atomists, on the other hand, uh, you know, on the contrary, disagreed with that. They believed that there is such thing as sort of empty nothingness, and which we can call the void then, right? So the void is not just space. You might think is having something in it like air or a very, you know, fine kind of substance. No, it's just nothingness, right? Um, their argument that there was a, a void, that the void exists, is that if there is no empty space, there cannot be motion. But there is a motion, therefore, there is empty space, right? That's a pretty simple argument, okay? Uh, what is not is not, right? They agreed that there is no nothing. That's what Parmenides also. So everybody seems to agree with Parmenides that what is not is not and nothing is not a thing, right? So the atoms conclude that the void, that empty space, is something, right? It's not nothing, otherwise it wouldn't exist, right? Um, so we do have a kind of a void, which is complete emptiness, right? Uh, somehow it's a nothing that's a something, right? Um, a nothing that exists. So uh, Lucretius has an empirical argument for empty space. And again, it's an argument, right, based on observation. And what he says is that things that, have the, that are the same size can have different weight, right? So we take something with the same volume, right? One can be heavier than the other. And this can only be the case if the one that's lighter has more empty space in it than the heavier object, right? So therefore, they, there is empty space, yeah? So if you just have this idea of being or stuffness, right? Something there, right, in your mind. And then you ask, okay, if two, let's say two two boxes, or let's, no, let's not be boxes, because things are inside it, right? Let's say you have two cubes or two stones, they're exactly the same size, two spheres, they're exactly the same size, right? But one is heavier than the other. 
then you're going to conclude that there's more being in one than another, right? And there can only be more being in one than the other if there's more nothingness in the second one than in the first, right? The lighter one has more emptiness in it than the second one. So therefore, there must be empty space according to that uh, argument. Okay. Now that we have the idea that there is empty space, the void, right? That is to say, again, the idea here is that if all the objects were removed and ceased to exist, there would still be this big emptiness, right? Which is a thing. It's not nothing, but it's big empty space with no things inside it. Um, and that's space, right? So the next thing they're going to say about this space, about this void, is that it is infinite, right? And this is their argument. If space were finite, it would have a limit, because that's what it means to be finite, right? But for every spatial limit of a thing, there is a space beyond that limit, right? So like my room is finite because it has a limit, so it's a finite space. But, right, obviously, on the other side of the wall, there's another room. And then on the other side of that wall, there's outside. So, uh, in, beyond any spatial limit, there's another side to it. There's a, there's a you know, uh, you can go across the limit. And there's more space there. So, that means that if space is finite, there would be space outside of space. Right? Because, you know, that limit would have something on the other side. But there's no space outside of space because that's a contradiction, right? I mean, we're talking about space itself, not just any limited space. And so if we're talking about space, you know, as such, then space is infinite, right? Okay, there's no limit to how much space there is. There couldn't be, according to this argument. All right. Now, if we go to the next sort of big step here. Right? Remember, now we, we, we just talked about some sort of postulates, right? When we add that all together, for the atomists, it equals, right, this conclusion. The world is an infinite plurality of very small but indivisible particles. Right? An in, infinite plurality, so there's an infinite number of different but very small but indivisible particles. Okay, and those they call the atoms. So the word atom comes from the Greek, and that means uncut because right tom means cut, uh, a means un or the opposite of right, or the non. So it's that which isn't cut, that which is indivisible, the indivisible particle atom, right? So it's quite a bit different from the atoms that we understand in, like you know, modern physics. Uh, which are in themselves consisting of other particles, right? Because these atoms can't consist of other particles since they are themselves the most basic particles and they're not divisible, right? Um, okay. So let's talk about those elements, right? So we have infinite, plurality, very small, indivisible, okay? Let's talk about plurality. It's important that they assert that there's a plurality, right? They don't believe that everything is one, like Thales, or, you know, uh, thinking that everything is water, right? They believe that there are many, many things, an infinite number of things, right? But each one is a particle. And the reason, again, just like the other pluralists, uh, like Empedocles and Anaxagoras, they've, you know, the atomists realize that without a, plurali plurali <laughs> without a plurality of particles, change would be impossible, right? And we'd have to agree with Parmenides that change doesn't really occur, right? But change does occur. This is what we can see when you can experience around us, right? So it doesn't make any sense for the atomists to claim like Parmenides that change is just an illusion, right? So therefore, there must be a plurality of particles, right? Um, so if we take an example of a sponge, right? If a sponge were kind of one continuous mass, if it didn't consist of any particles, or let's say if the, if the sponge itself was like a big atom, right? You couldn't squeeze it, right? Uh, the only way to explain how you can squeeze an atom or how you can squeeze any object like, like a sponge, 
right? Not an atom, I'm sorry. Is to theorize that it is actually particles and void. And that when you squeeze it, right, into a smaller space, you push the particles together into the smaller space, right? And into the empty space, which is there. Because otherwise, you know, let's say if I take a sponge and it's like this big, and, 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 and you can't see my video, right? Let's say you take a sponge, right? It's like, you know, so big, right? And then you squeeze it down, then the sponge is smaller. Now, you know, are you going to say that something that was existing now ceased to exist? That, you know, there's less sponge there than there was before because a whole bunch of the sponge disappeared from existence? No, what's happening is that the actual sponge that was there has been, right, compressed into a smaller space. And so for the atomist, the only way you can make sense of that is to say that right, there is empty space and that there's now more sponge per space, right, when you squeeze it down, right? That way, you can see what they're doing, right? They're actually following one of the Parmenidean rules. What is, is, and what is not, is not. Nothing can come to exist or cease to exist, right? Matter isn't created or destroyed, it's just changed. And so we have the same amount of matter in the sponge, it's just if we we squeeze it down into a smaller space, but this requires that we postulate empty space or void, right, which we can now put into that ratio that there's more or less matter or being per void, right? Um, so the second thing though, and the thing that, that causes some difficulty or challenge for atomism is that the, the plurality uh, that they conceive as quantitative and not qualitative. Right. So here the atomists are getting the influence of Anaximenes. Remember who said that everything is air because he wanted to explain all the qualitative plurality in terms of the quantitative only. Right. Atoms are only different in size and shape and they don't have any qualities other than just being there, according to the atomists. Right. There is no fiery atoms or water atoms or lion ab atoms or cabbage atoms like the way Anaxagoras has in his theory of seeds where each seed has its particular quality that makes it the kind of thing and explains that kind of thing, right? Here, the atoms are just quantitative. There's just, you know, the size and shape and number and that's all, right? Um, they're just there, yeah? And that's why the they might be giants in their song, as you just heard, said about Particle Man, right? What's he like? Uh, it doesn't matter. Nobody knows, right? And they asked, right, when, when, when he's in the water, does he get wet or does the water get him instead, right? Nobody knows. It, it doesn't matter. Because the question with the atomism is exactly that about qualities, right? For example, where does water come from and how do things become, or how are things watery if they're just atoms and no atoms are watery, right? Okay. Uh, anyway, we will go on to the infinity uh, question. The atomists believe that there are an infinite number of atoms, right? And this is because, right, they think the world is, a combi is combinations of atoms in the void, right? The things around us are actually combinations of atoms, right? Uh, arranged in certain ways in the void, right? But the void is infinite. They, as they already think they have proved. Um, and now, infinity, this is how we could put the argument. Infinity is infinitely more than any finite number, right? So, therefore, if the number of atoms were finite, the probability that they would ever combine would be infinitely low, right? So, let's take you have an infinite space and you have a finite number of atoms. No matter how many atoms you have, right? If you think about what the probability of any of those atoms ever contacting each other is in an infinite space, it would be infinitely low, right? And so the probability, you know, if the probability of atoms combining were infinitely low, then they would not combine, yeah? Right, I mean, so let's say that there's like, a hundred trillion atoms, well then the, the, the chances that any of them would ever contact each other inside infinite space would be 100 trillion in infinity chance. 
but a hundred and trillion, a hundred trillion in infinity is just like one chance in infinity. It turns out to be essentially zero chance, right? So they will not combine. Yeah. Um, if the number of in in if then if the number of atoms were in were finite, there would be no world at all. Yeah, because that's what the world is. If atoms never combine or contact each other then there wouldn't be any things because that's what things are and so since there are things that means that the number of atoms also has to be infinite otherwise there's no chance of them combining right all right so we have an infinite number of atoms in an infinite void combining with each other and that's how we get things around us mm -hmm. now the atomists think that they Atoms are very small, but not infinitely small. Yeah? Um, and here's the argument, and then we'll stop there. Yeah? They say that if the atoms are infinitely small, then matter will be infinitely divisible. But if matter were not infinitely divisible, then what is would become what is not. What is cannot become what is not. Therefore, matter is infinitely divisible. Therefore, there is an indivisible particle of matter. That's what they call the atom, right? Obviously, and therefore, the atoms are not infinitely small. Okay. You can see here that in this argument, the key premise is the second one. If matter were infinitely divisible, then what is would become what is not, right? And then we have it that what is cannot become what is not. And remember, that's the insight from Parmenides right, that is sort of now axiomatic, right, which is also, you know, directing the thought of the atomists. But we have to ask, what do they mean by this? If matter were infinitely, infinitely divisible, then what is would become what is not. So I'll leave that for you to think about. What do they mean by that? Why are they saying that? And when we come back next class, uh, you can share your thoughts about what the idea is there course because that's the key premise all right then thank you very much and i'll see you on tuesday